Hello, and welcome to Lecture 7 in this series on drugs and human behavior. We just finished discussing uh, neuron and neurotransmission, and now we'll get into some more specifics about the kinds of receptors that drugs tend to interact with. And so this entire lecture will be about those receptors uh, and how they interact with particular drugs. So there are different types of drug receptor effects. The first of these is uh, drugs can bind uh, to uh, a particular receptor. So binding to a site of a normal endogenous neurotransmitter can initiate a similar cellular response, what we call an agonist action. So essentially the drug is taking the replace of that normally internally produced neurotransmitter. Similarly, they can bind to a nearby site to facilitate neurotransmitter binding. This is called an allosteric action. So for example, GABA is an allosteric agonist of GABA because it binds to a nearby site that facilitates the action of the neurotransmitter GABA. You can also have binding to a receptor site which completely blocks access of a transmitter to that particular binding site, and we call this antagonistic action. So for example, the drug uh, naloxone, which is also known as Narcan, blocks access of opioids to the um, site of their action. And so by blocking that site and uh, not allowing any access to that, it's a complete antagonist of those uh, opioids, thereby reversing an overdose. To give you an idea, um, we might have an agonist, which will increase the response of a receptor, a partial agonist, which will somewhat increase the response of that receptor, an antagonist that will block it, and an inverse agonist. And an inverse agonist will actually cause the exact opposite effect that we would expect of a particular receptor. So an antagonist drug by itself might produce no response possible to determine if a drug has an antagonistic action by seeing if it reduces the effect of an agonist. So for example, uh, there are a couple different antagonistic drugs we'll talk about and how they reduce the effects of an agonist. So flumazenil is a drug that blocks the action of benzodiazepines. So it is a benzodiazepine antagonist, and in particular a GABA antagonist, because it reduces the effect of those benzodiazepines. These can be irreversible or non-competitive antagonists. And what they do is they cause a downward shift of the maximum with no shift of the curve on the do dose axis. So essentially, it's pushing down the effect of that drug by completely um, providing an antagonist action. We'll talk about uh, dose response curves uh, here in, actually, yes, we'll talk about dose response curves coming up uh, in uh, an upcoming lecture. So we talk about these kind of dose response curves, this is what one might, one might look like. So we have an agonist dose that's having its effect. We have a, an agonist plus a competitive antagonist, so it's actually pushing it um, to uh, change its effect. Um, we might have an irreversible agon antagonist, and so we actually can shove the curve down so that we're actually not getting uh, and a, uh, any action itself. So the effect of an irreversible antagonist is to reduce the maximum, whereas a, a competitive antagonist is simply to shift the effect of the dose. So a brief summary of this phar pharmacodynamics, agonists bind to receptors to produce a functional response. Agonists can be full, partial, or inverse. Antagonists block or refer reverse the effects of agonists. And antagonists can be competitive or non-competitive slash irreversible. So their effects will depend on the kind of drug we're talking about. Most of the drugs we uh, talk about as being full non-competitive antagonists are drugs like flumazenil, nar uh, naloxone, and naltrexone, which completely block the action of um, opioid agonists, or in the case of flumazenil, uh, benzo benzodiazepine agonists. So uh, that gets us then to talking about how all this works. And so we'll spend some time talking about receptors for drug action. We'll start by talking about drugs and receptors, talk about ion channel receptors, or what we call ionotropic receptors. We'll talk about G-protein coupled receptors, or what are called metabotropic receptors, uh, talk about transporter proteins, and then finally talk about um, digestive enzymes in the synapse. So basic principle of pharmacology is that effects induced by a drug follow from interaction with those receptors. In particular, in, pharmacolo in psychopharmacology, uh, we're talking about receptors primarily in the brain. 
So that drug receptor binding causes changes in the function of neurons, resulting in that drug's characteristic response. So understanding the causes or the um, what changes a particular drug causes in a neuron is an important part of understanding its response. So the strength of that attachment is determined by the three-dimensional shape of the drug and the receptor. So as we alter different types of drugs, they might have strong attachment or weaker attachment depending on the shape of the drug itself. And in fact, we'll talk here in a moment about what we call isomers of the same drug that have just simply a reversed shape. And one might have a very strong effect and the other a weak effect because they don't attach. So there are many receptor subtypes for the endogenous neurotransmitters, and when we talk about an endogenous neurotransmitter, we're simply talking about a neurotransmitter that has been produced naturally inside the body. When we introduce a drug, uh, we call that an exogenous uh, effect. So the endogenous neurotransmitters in a drug may have greater or lesser affinity to specific subtypes. So when we get into things like antidepressants, we'll talk about how this particular drug has an affinity for 5-HT2, this one has an affinity for 5-HT3. Similarly, we'll talk about dopamine and dopamine 1 and 2, uh, et cetera. So these are important considerations when we start talking about the, the pharmacodynamics of a particular drug. So ion channel receptors are those that act particularly quickly. So cell membrane spanning receptors uh, that form an ion channel, these are usually ion channel receptors. The attachment of a neurotransmitter or drug usually causes, or will cause, I should say, uh, a specific ion to flow or not flow uh, through a particular channel. So when we talk about something like GABA, it allows more chloride to cross the uh, membrane of the cell, thereby hyperpolarizing the cell and making it less likely to um, initiate an action potential. So there are also, of course, drugs that might block an ion from flowing through the channel. So, and this is talked about in the action potential lecture, um, drugs like lidocaine or novocaine actually block the sodium channel and prevent an action potential from being generated altogether. Some drugs then serve as an allosteric agonist, which facilitates a neurotransmitter on that ionotropic receptor. So for example, benzodiazepines are an allosteric agonist of the GABA receptor, increasing the flow of chloride ions into a cell, decreasing the probability of uh, an action potential by hyperpolarizing that cell, and as a result, it quiets neurotransmission. So that's one of the reasons why these drugs are considered what we call anxiolytic. That is, they reduce anxiety, but they also have some side effects like reducing memory and the potential for doing things like reducing respiration. So if we take a look at um, this kind of ionotropic cell receptor, either it can be open or closed. This is a channel through the um, membrane of a particular neuron, and so these um, binding sites can cause this to be more likely to be open or more likely to be closed, or in the event of something like uh, lidocaine, completely blocking this channel altogether. So if we look then at GABA and the benzodiazepine, as well as barbiturates, and so when we get to talking about um, these drugs later on, uh, this is the receptor we'll be talking about. And so what happens is if a benzodiazepine like Xanax binds here, it makes it more likely that this uh, chloride channel will be open, uh, high, further hyperpolarizing the inside of this cell. So G-protein coupled receptors are also known as metabotropic receptors. Activation of these receptors causes the release of a G-protein within the cell, which causes several potential effects. These tend to be much longer lasting effects, whereas the ionotropic receptor uh, effects are immediate. So they can act by directly or indirectly, indirectly um, opening or closing ion channels. And they do that uh, through secondary messengers such as cyclic AMP in an indirect manner. They can also directly or indirectly have an effect on cell metabolism enzyme activity, or even gene expression. And this becomes very important as we start trying to understand the ways in which uh, antidepressant drugs work because they are causing long-term alterations in the functioning of neurons. And so we really have to think carefully about how uh, these metabotropic receptors are having longer-term uh, effects on uh, the processes inside a neuron itself, because they can be having these long-term, even epigenetic alterations in the way these particular uh, cells function. So here you can see um, 
we have a G protein complex, and we have a neurotransmitter that binds to that site. We then get the release of that protein inside the cell itself. So these can then um, have an effect on the neurotransmitter or on that um, the area of uh, receptor as well, or it can go travel to another ionotropic receptor channel and open that or close that channel, uh, having an effect on then the probability of generating an action potential. So a summary of this process, we have either a transmitter or a hormone or a drug binds to the receptor. That G protein can then be released and then have effects on channel activity, uh, change in the amounts of neurotransmitter released, change in the firing pattern of a neuron or cell, and then some sort of biological response. Transporter proteins are another important receptor for drug action, uh, in particular uh, for uh, things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The transport proteins carry large molecules against their concentration gradient into the cell. So again, this is critical for psychoactive compounds that are presynaptic transporters that bind neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft and transport them back into the presynaptic terminal, um, terminating their action. So many psychoactive drugs exert their influence by blocking these presynaptic transport proteins. Essentially, that's how selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors work, is by blocking the presynaptic transporter from taking serotonin back into the presynaptic cell, thereby increasing the amount of serotonin available in the synapse, and thereby um, causing uh, downstream changes in the postsynaptic cell by increasing the amount of serotonin available. So again, this is how SSRIs uh, work, this is how cocaine works, and a variety of other drugs work by blocking that presynaptic transport protein. So we can actually um, see this sort of schematically um, drawn up here where that transporter protein is bringing that transmitter back into the cell and these can be blocked then by uh, specific drugs. Finally, we have enzymes in the synapse. These enzymes regulate the synaptic availability of neurotransmitters by breaking them down into their constituent components. Uh, the biggest example of these include acetylcholinesterase as well as monoamine oxidase. So drugs that inhibit these enzymes increase their synaptic availability. So MAOIs uh, increase the uh, synaptic availability of dopamine and norepinephrine and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, increase the synaptic availability of acetylcholine. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are some important drug receptor interactions to consider. In particular, drug receptor spec specificity. Receptors demonstrate a high spec specificity for particular neurotransmitters in certain drug molecules. And as I was saying before, this has primarily to do with the three-dimensional structure of the drug and the three-dimensional structure of the receptor itself. This is a bit like a lock and a key. Important to understand are optical isomers of different drugs. So isomers are molecules formed around a carbon atom with the same molecular formula, but in a different configuration. So this includes all the same pieces, they're just put together in a different structure. So isomers represent forms that are mirror images of one another, and we call these optical isomers or optical isomerism. Simple substances that show optical isomerism exist as one or more and ten telomeres. And these enantiomeres, sorry, it's a hard word to say, these enantiomeres uh, are important in understanding the efficacy of a drug. And so in particular, we're going to talk about different optical isomers of drugs like amphetamine uh, and um, escitalopram, which are important drugs, uh, important psychoactive drugs. So the enantiomeres uh, are, uh, have differential effects on a particular receptors. So uh, the uh, left and right uh, versions of these are usually called, referred to as D as de dextrorotary or um, levorotary to the left. So we have dextroamphetamine and levoamphetamine, D-amphetamine and L-amphetamine. In most cases, only one of the optical isomers behave the same way biologically, and usually one is more potent than the other. Most drugs are a 50-50 mixture of both an enantiomeres. And we call this a racemic mix or race mates. So for example, Celexa is a racemic mixture of citalopram. Lexapro is only the active, active isomer as citalopram. 
So the escitalopram is more potent and requires lower dosages. Adderall is a racemic mix of the more potent D-amphetamine and the less potent L-amphetamine. Dexedrine is only the more potent D-amphetamine. So these racemic mix of these different isomers are important to understand the potency of particular drugs because in the case of Adderall, for example, the amphetamine component is the much more potent component, um, whereas the L-amphetamine is a much less potent uh, version. And so it's essentially kind of a watered-down version of dexedrine. These drugs can, of course, have uh, both acute and chronic receptor effects. The immediate response from a psychoactive drug by narrowing binding to a receptor is known as its acute effect. What is its immediate effect? The long-term use of a psychoactive drug can result in chronic changes to receptor activity. The first off is downregulation or desensitization, and this occurs when receptors respond less to a substance or the number of receptors decreases. So by downregulating a receptor site, it's simply responding less and less. This is one of the ways in which we develop tolerance to <clears throat> Drugs. So when we've been using a drug a number of times, uh, we oftentimes will downregulate those receptors, so we're getting less and less of an effect, and so that requires increasing the dose to get a similar response. Upregulation or supersensitivity occurs due to a receptor being blocked by an antagonist drug. So for example, nicotine is an antagonist of GABA, and GABA is of course an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So what happens is in the presence of nicotine, those GABA receptors are upregulated or become more sensitive to the presence of GABA because they've been being blocked by nicotine. When you take away the nicotine, we now get supersensitivity of those GABA receptors and they respond with a much stronger response. As a result, people who are withdrawing from nicotine oftentimes have uh, difficulties with their memory and oftentimes are very anxious because of that change in GABA regulation. So it's something very important to understand about the long-term effects of different types of drugs. So if we look at so the normal receptor type here, neurotransmission occurring, normal effect, normal number of neurotransmitters. When they've been downregulated, we either reduce the number of receptor sites or um, block the amount of uh, or the receptors respond in a different way. So essentially it takes more neurotransmitter to get this cell to respond. Whereas in upregulation, we get an increase of the effect of that neurotransmitter because we have been giving an antagonist. Well, that's a quick introduction to uh, different receptors and how they respond. We'll continue with our discussions of pharmacodynamics in the next lecture.